This is a lecture for my professional responsibility class about Model Rule 1.8G, ABA Model Rule 1.8G. And in this video lecture, we're going to be talking about a very specific rule about making aggregate settlements on behalf of clients. Here's our rule. A lawyer who represents two or more clients shall not participate participate in making an aggregate settlement of the claims of or against the clients, or in a criminal case, an aggregate agreement as to guilty or no low contendery pleas, unless each client gives informed consent in a writing signed by the client. So, oh, what are we talking about here? We're talking about a um, you are representing co-plaintiffs or co-defendants in the same litigation. And please notice that this includes a writing requirement. This makes it a, an easy um, point to test in a multiple choice question on the MPRE. The lawyer's disclosure shall include the existence and nature of all the claims and pleas involved and of the participation of each person in the settlement. Now, um, before we go to the comments, the ABA's official comments, I want to just explain a little bit about what's going on with this rule. Some of our conflicts of interest rules relate to conflicts between um, two clients who you represent that maybe they're adverse to each other in the litiga in litigation or um, uh, different parties in a negotiation or something like that. Some of our rules about the lawyer's self-interest um, against a client, like when you're making a business transaction with a client. And you may be wondering why this particular rule is under the section that's generally about those, and I'll explain in a second. We have another type of conflict of interest rules you may remember from our lectures on Rule 1.7 about what happens when you are representing multiple people sort of as in a single matter and they're all on one side. So from their perspective, their legal interests for this representation are completely aligned. They're all the plaintiffs in the same lawsuit or they're all the defendants in the same lawsuit or they're co-conspirators facing charges together in the same criminal prosecution. And so from their perspective, it's easy to kind of miss the conflict there that's going to happen because it seems like they're not adverse to each other. And one of the main problems, we've already spent a lot of time talking about this in another lecture that arises is when we, you reach that point of decision about whether to accept a settlement offer or extend a settlement offer or go to trial. And, um, and you could end up having that group have a disagreement among themselves about what would be best for them. And it's, it's not uncommon that you have some who want to go to trial because of the principle of the thing or something like that. And, and they, th or they think that they're going to win a lot more money or win or have to pay a lot less money or something like that. And others want to get this over with, or they're more pragmatic or something like that. I, I have to tell you the more people, more experienced people are in litigation, <laughs> Um, the more likely they are to just want to settle uh, most of the time. And so now <clears throat> the, that could be an, a, a disagreement. The other thing that this rule is talking about is then sometimes they can disagree about who should receive what share. If you're representing, let's say, two or three plaintiffs that were in a car together, they got in an accident, they're suing the person that injured them, and, and the, a settlement offer has been for the aggregate amount of the claim. If somebody's willing to pay them, let's say, their whole life, all of the insurance coverage that they have. So maybe they have a million dollar policy and they're willing to give you a million dollars to divide among your clients. Well, you could have one plaintiff or victim who um, was admitted to that had a long hospital stay. So they have a astronomical medical bills. They were in the hospital for a month, but now they're fully recovered and can go back to their life, but they have bills they can't pay. On the other hand, another person in the group might have had um, received less medical attention and have lower medical bills, but they're unable to return to their old job because of their, now they have a disability, right? So they were injured in a way that prevents them from returning to their line of work, or they missed a lot of work. And so they have really significant lost wages. These two people might, each one of them might think they're more deserving of a larger share of the settlement. You could also have that it's very common the person it, that one of the people in this group is really paying for the lawyer or hired the lawyer for the whole group, and you shouldn't be surprised that they then expect to it, it be compensated out of the it, above their share 
for the costs of the lawyer. And all of a sudden the others may disagree about that. Um, you could have someone who says, I'm broke. I really need more money and you guys are really wealthy. So why do you, you're well off already and have great jobs. Why do you need such a big share? And they're going to, when there's money involved, people start arguing and now you have a problem. And I want you to, and the same can happen on the defense side. I hope you can see that you have co-defendants like a corporation and one of their employees and they're going to disagree about um, uh, who should pay what amount uh, as, a, as a defendant, even if the plaintiff says, look, we'll settle this claim for $100,000. And each of the defendants at that point starts arguing about this. Now, here's something to keep in mind. You may um, have, if you have worked somewhere before law school at a, a large organization or corporation, you, um, some workplaces, they keep, it's kind of a, custom that they keep secret what everybody's paid, right? Other places, everybody knows what everyone else makes, but there's a lot of workplaces in America where the management wants, doesn't it, it like creates this sort of ethos or ethic in the, or norm in the workplace that nobody ever tells anybody else how much they get paid. And there can be pragmatic reasons for you to keep your mouth shut about how much you're paid. But from uh, the people who are in charge, really uh, it's better for them when they're negotiating because they don't have somebody coming in their office demanding a raise because they're the lowest, they're paid a lot less for doing the same work than somebody else. You'd be giving people raises all the time. And so it's in their interest often to keep the employees ignorant of what their other employees are earn or, or are paid so that if you have one person who's a good negotiator and can get a raise, you don't have to give a raise to everybody. And as lawyers, when you're representing a group, you're, you may face the same temptation to, it's hard to manage a group of people who are disagreeing about who deserves what. And you may be tempted to play a game of, look, I'm just going to ask you, is this amount acceptable to you? And nobody, you don't worry about what everybody else gets. And you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to try to keep your clients in the dark about how much the other people, your other co-clients are either receiving or having to pay. Um, it's a lot easier to convince people that it, to have people be satisfied with a share if they don't know what everybody else's share is. When people know that somebody's getting a better deal, they really resent that, um, even though they would have been happy with their share otherwise. And you as a lawyer are going to know that, and you're going to be tempted to try to um, have everybody only know their number and you're just not allowed to do that. That's what this rule is about. Make sure that you're clear on that. So let's go back to our rule and we're going to now move into the ABA comments for the rule. Differences in willing to make or accept an offer of settlement are among the risks of, of common representation of multiple clients by a single lawyer. Under Rule 1.7, this is one of the risks that should be discussed before undertaking the representation as part of the process of obtaining the client's informed consent. You should already have told them, warned them that this was going to happen. It's very foreseeable, very kind of an everyday occurrence that a group of plaintiffs or a group of defendants are going to start haggling with each other and bickering about who should get what share or who should pay what share. In addition, one, Rule 1 1.2, which we haven't gotten to yet in this course, protects each client's right to have a final say in deciding whether to accept or reject an offer of settlement and in deciding whether to accept or reject plea bargains in criminal cases. And so we're going to get to this, but the clients have an absolute rule. You're never allowed to just substitute your own judgment for your client about whether to accept a, a settlement um, or plea bargain or turn it down. You have to ask the client. Rule 13, or I'm sorry, comment 13 continuing. The, com the rule stated in this paragraph is a corollary of both of these rules, and it provides that before any settlement offer or plea bargain is made or accepted on behalf of multiple clients, a lawyer must inform each of them about all the material terms of the settlement, including what the other clients will receive or pay if the settlement or plea offer is accepted. By the way, I have to tell, I'm going to interrupt myself here and tell my students, I don't see this, I haven't seen this rule tested in a long time on the MPRE. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to have some questions on it on your MPRE, but it's, it, it, there's, I don't, there's not a lot of multiple choice questions about this. And if there are, it's going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the lawyer didn't ask everybody in the group or didn't tell everybody in the group all of the information. And so 
um, but this isn't one of the of the conflicts of interest rules. Um, that this is not one of the ones that you get a lot of questions on on the MPRE. Okay, let's continue with comment 13. Lawyers representing a class of plaintiffs or defendants or those proceeding derivatively may not have a full client lawyer relationship with each member of the class. Nevertheless, such lawyers must comply with applicable rules regulating notification of class members and other procedural requirements designed to ensure adequate protection of the entire class. So if you've been listening to this, how do we do this aggregate settlement when you, you're doing a class action and there's 10,000 members of the class? And the answer is you kind of don't, right? This doesn't really apply to class actions because for purposes of conflicts, as we said with rule 1.7, um, class members are not really clients for purposes of conflict analysis most of the time. On the other hand, when you do class action litigation, there's a, a pretty onerous set of procedural protections for the members of the class, notice, uh, notice requirements and things like that. Um, and you, are at, you will have an ethical duty to comply with those in order to protect the members of the class and not take advantage of them. We do have an ABA ethics opinion from 2006, 438 that is relevant here um, that uh, just clarifies the rule. And, um, and you should think of this ethics opinion 438 as essentially part of the rule for purposes of the MPRE because the MPRE treats these ethics opinions as if they were the, the rule. In seeking consent of multiple clients to aggregate settlement, a lawyer must advise each client of, and here's your little checklist, the total settlement amount, the nature and amount of each client's participation, and fees and costs to be paid to the lawyer, and how those costs will be apportioned to each client. So each client has to understand not only how much is, are all the other clients getting, they need to, you have to spell out for them what the total amount is, and what your share as the lawyer is, and how much each party is functionally contributing to your share and to other costs. What kind of costs? Court filing costs, um, paying court reporters for depositions, um, uh, experts that you hired, experts, jury consultants, and um, other th types of things like that that you had to, that are the cost of litigation can really get costly. And um, and clients are going to have different ideas about who should pay that, and they have to know that before you can ask them to agree uh, to, to a settlement, and they're gonna have to put it in writing that they've agreed to all of this. Here's our review question in case you need a document that you watch this video. A lawyer represents co-defendants in a civil lawsuit, a corporation and its employee who directly caused the plaintiff's injury. The company is paying the lawyer's fees. The plaintiff offers to settle the case for a modest amount. The company insists on settling, but the employee wants to be vindicated in a public trial. How should the lawyer respond? A, the lawyer should wait to get a consensus decision, or B, the lawyer should do what the corporation wants because the corporation is paying the lawyer's fees. Hopefully you know the answer to that from watching this lecture or listening to this uh, lecture. If you don't, you need to review because that should have been clear to you uh, by now. 